So, I don't know why, but I first want to just start off saying this. I just seen that the uh, new uh, Tarzan movie that came out well, last year. And I don't know. It just bothers me in a way, you know, getting on that whole out of Africa idea. When here's a man that they've made famous, right? And the fact that he could communicate with the animals in Africa, but yet Africans or the people they call Africans couldn't do what he could do. I just find that odd, you know? Like, if they try to teach you the narrative that you're out of Africa and that you're Africans, how come the people in Africa couldn't do what Tarzan, a, a young, you know, British boy, lost there could do? You know? I don't know why, but getting on to the heart of what matters, um, I just want to say, I have these dreams, right? And I've had them since I was a child. And the more I talked about it, the more I found out I'm not the only one, <clears throat> which made me feel better because the stuff I went through uh, in my earlier uh, youth, uh, I kept stuff like, you know, this to myself because I didn't want people to think I was crazy, you know? Um, <clears throat> but I used to have these dreams, and I don't have them so often uh, now, but I had these dreams, and in these dreams, what I found out is if I can't see the faces of people in the dreams, but the dreams feel real, they actually end up coming true, you know, and they're not significant, you know, on any scale, like they're not, you know, earth shattering, you know, I might just remember, you know, later on, you know, that uh, somebody was wearing a certain outfit and they said a certain thing, you know, a certain phrase or something like that, and it takes me back to the dream I had, and I'm like, wow, I, I had that in my dream, and other dreams, if I could see the faces of the people in it, I noticed they never they have never come true. So one dream I had I was defending myself against uh European Americans four of them and in that dream I didn't use a gun but I used um I don't know how to describe it because I don't know what it is, but I've been chasing after, but I used uh, some type of force that felt hot like a heat wave, but it came from my hands, you know, and I've been searching around just trying to figure out what the heck that is. Now, believe me, I'm not trying to say I'm any kind of supernatural. I've never, I don't know, I don't know nothing about that stuff. I'm not trying to glorify myself. I'm just saying, I know there's other people out here that are like this, that have these dreams and they look into them, and that's what I do. I write them down so I don't forget them, and I look into it so when it comes up, you know, it's not, it's like, it's like I've seen it, right? Well, oh, I feel weird just even talking about this, but, so, you know, one of the things that's caught my attention is just the more you look into Asian stuff, you know, the more you find out that them, and especially the Persians, know about the the kind of stuff I was dreaming about, I guess, you know. And one of the things it brought up was jujitsu. Now we've all seen it, we've all heard about it, but one of the things I realized while reading about jujitsu is that while we always see the martial arts side, the fights outside to it, They've never told us about the spell casting and the using of the elements to jujitsu. Most students, athletes, masters, or grandmasters of martial arts allocate time for the development of physical attributes such as the cardiovascular system or the musculature system, cognizant of the impact of anatomical systems that can perform for a longer period of time and at a higher output than ordinary. But such things, as beneficial as they are, can by no means be the first concern or the first goals sought by the student of combat. To learn the art itself must be the first priority, and the comprehension of that curriculum must precede all considerations, such as becoming stronger, heavier, leaner, or faster. These latter attributes, of course, will develop over and in their own time, but supplementing martial practice with an extracurricular commitment is going to require a division of focus and resources, which means we must be very sure before we make such expenditures.
It has been a goal of this writer to meet auxiliary objectives like strength or respiratory development by enhancing the martial training regimen itself using ankle or wrist weights, accelerating pace to create conditions to promote cardiovascular goals, all while never allowing focus on the martial training to falter or waver. The notion that a high proportion of muscle mass will place a massive magnification on combat skill is as reasonable as the notion that the ability to fight will make it far easier to lift weights. A gymnast, a bodybuilder, and a marathon runner have about as much chance of beating a martial artist in a fight as the martial artist does of outperforming the gymnast on the pommel horse, the bodybuilder in a deadlift, or the marathon runner in a 42.2 kilometer run. It's the kind of uninformed supposition that ranks with the idea that a marathon runner will make an excellent soccer player because he's good at running. It entirely ignores the necessity of ball control, passing technique, and shooting technique, all while maintaining the first focus, which is the protection of the ball. The marathon runner's conditioning in itself wouldn't be unhelpful, but it would only be useful if the person had the basic skills of the game in question. Now imagine a male ballerina. They have far more flexibility and more balance than someone in Taekwondo. But does this mean that a ballerina will win full contact striking tournaments and fend off street attackers? Absurd. The question as to how much strength is required to begin a study of combat discipline is not hard to answer, but what is a little more complicated to explain is the effect a physical attribute like strength has on martial practice. To begin, a person needs little to nil, and this is because the challenges early on are going to be structured and measured to stay within the ability of the student. To impart the early and essential precepts, the displacements and understanding of bodily limitations, and the introductory techniques, it is most necessary to stay within the student's ability. Otherwise, the only persons that would possess the ability to perform the maneuvers are those that have already learned them somewhere else. While only a very little strength is required to begin, because the opponent's attacks are carefully restrained and controlled, doesn't mean the process of learning is designed to remain that way. Eventually, little by little, the restraints are slowly slackened, and this predictably forces the student to work much harder to make the same maneuvers succeed. While strength will be forced to increase as the training unfolds, it will not be the attribute relied upon to perform the maneuvers, as it itself will be insufficient to accomplish such a task. The maneuvers will continue to succeed because skill level in the student has been undergoing a steady increase. To accomplish the maneuvers, the actual principles of the martial processes must become sharper and faster, a state of being only comprehension and repetition and amelioration can produce. Strength is much like balance, reflex, coordination, and stamina. A critical minimum is required not to learn the art, but to eventually fight with it. These critical minimums could be understood as that smallest amount of reflex, balance, agility, coordination, strength, stamina, or flexibility necessary that must be present for a student to be able to practically execute the maneuver. If someone begins a practice and is already very flexible, balanced, or strong, it will be that much easier to learn maneuvers that demand these minimums. But the danger is that such natural ability is seductively easy to become dependent on, a crutch basically, allowing us to have shoddier technical skill and to make up for it with our innate physiological characteristics. This can be neutralized as a pitfall by forcing the flexible, stronger, or faster student into performing the maneuver with greater resistance earlier in the curriculum and force them away from a potential dependence on bodily advantages. If, on the other hand, someone begins a practice and is uncommonly rigid, unbalanced, or weak, it will be more difficult to learn the maneuvers, but the advantage is that the learning will require a heavy emphasis on combat principles and processes, compensating for deficiencies of anatomy with hyper-accurate execution of movements and heightened usage of the art's precepts, assuming the potential capability exists. This is what I'm just talking about. I'll show, show just a short clip of this. Hi, my name but they always focus on the fight styles, it seems. They never really teach you about the, uh, you know, what you just the read. Jiu -jitsu the jiu-jitsu is the, the The spell casting, the mystical part to it. And just to find that jiu-jitsu is uh, the core, it seems as if the core to um, a lot of that Hindu stuff. And, you know, when we watch those videos about the original people of, of, of India and the fact that, you know, that they were our ancestors and they foretold about the Americas and stuff like that and the 50 states and all that, you really start to sit back and wonder, you know, 
who's are also a part of our you know our ancestral you know uh, traditions that have been lost. Let me skip that here. Jiu-Jitsu. Then you got to look at how many positions there are in Jiu-Jitsu. How many positions do you think there are in Jiu-Jitsu? There's about 25. Okay, and there's about 15 areas in Jiu-Jitsu. So if you look at like you've got stand up, you've got guard passing, you've got sweeping, you've got mount control positions, back control. There's about 15 areas in Jiu-Jitsu. And then there's about 25 positions in all those areas. For example, if you're doing guard passing, you've got half guard passing, you've got uh, half spider, you've got spider guard passing, you've got 50-50 passing, you've got all these different positions, butterfly guard passing, all these different positions. So there's about, fifth, uh, what is it? about 15 of those. And then... But, I mean, I won't play all this because I don't want to waste too much of your time, but, I mean, you get the idea that, you know, I just thought it was interesting that they don't really show any of the other stuff besides the fight style, and maybe that's something that's more for the learned person, but... I just thought that was interesting, you know, when you, you sit back and you just watch about, you know, this stuff. And just to show you, like, too, like, uh, let me see here, it's, uh, the history of it, right? Practice by boot. It did, it, like, 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 look, it, it comes out of India. I guess what some I'm historians to say. of jujitsu say that the origins of the gentle art can be. Some historians of jujitsu say that. Historians of jujitsu. Let me sorry. Take some break. historians of jujitsu say that the origins of the gentle art can be traced back to India, where it was practiced by Buddhist monks, concerned with self-defense. Take back to India. All our Mercedes-Benz SUV experience. Oh come on. And sports car heritage. Sorry about that. China, just to name a few. Even the art, science, music, literature, drama, the whole culture, particularly the religion of all the people of Asia can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. India, Japan, China, just to name a few, even Afro-American history can be traced directly to the Africans of Asia. What is it? I know it sounds strange to you, but the world owes a debt to the Africans of Asia. In the following presentation, you'll find out exactly why. Just give me a few seconds. Your ancestors never intended to let you down. In this book called The Gods of Northern Buddhism, we find a name. So, you know, just, just pointing that out, if jujitsu uh, is the is the root of the Hindu stuff and the Buddha stuff, right? Then I mean, you're looking at the older art form, right? So so the the spell casting as far as the hand fights and the learning how to use the elements to your advantage and all of that just takes you further and further back to the root of what was ours. You know, that's just how I look at it. Anyways. Let me see here. I was just pointing out the hand signs there. I'll leave that in the description box. I also have it on Google Plus. And, you know, I'm just, just reading about that. It was interesting here. The jujitsu part. I know they give it credit to, to Japan, but <clears throat> just listening to some of the other guys that have done videos on this, you know, they claim that it comes out of India and not the other way around. Anyways, so. I'm just going to leave this here. Check it out, you know. Anyways, everyone, have a good night.